Hi, I'm Scott Jackson from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'll be talking with you today about climate adaptation. I'm going to begin with a quick overview of climate change and what it is and how it's likely to affect us here in Massachusetts and New England, and then talk about ways that we can cope with climate change, something that we refer to as climate adaptation. So to summarize, basically the reason why we can even live here on this planet is, is that there is a thin layer of atmosphere around the Earth that helps protect us from the harmful rays of the sun. And that atmosphere is made up mostly of nitrogen gas and oxygen with trace amounts of a variety of other gases, including carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor. These other gases often act like a pane of glass and provide what's called the greenhouse effects so that as the sun's energy comes through the atmosphere and strikes the earth, some of it is reflected back into space and a portion of that reflected energy is then kept close to the Earth by these greenhouse gases. And as the amount of greenhouse gas in our atmosphere increases over time, we get stronger and stronger greenhouse effect, which leads to global warming. One of the principal greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide. And we can see from this graph, which shows in the red squares, the amount of carbon dioxide in trapped air bubbles in ice cores that were excavated that over the past thousand years, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has been relatively constant. And it's only been in the fairly recent past, since about the mid 1800s, that we've seen a gradual and then accelerating increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is due to the burning of fossil fuels for energy, first coal, coal and then oil and gas. And that has increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in addition, some of our other activities, such as gas exploration and the, the farming of cattle and other livestock, has increased the amount of methane in our atmosphere as well. And these two are very potent greenhouse gases and it has led to global warming. So you can see in this graph where the horizontal line across the graph is the average over the past 140 years or so. And those that extend below the graph are below average, and those that are above the graph in, in red are above average. So you can see that over the past 140 years, uh, we have had a gradual increase globally in the temperature. This has uh, resulted in some changes, such as uh, shorter winters and longer growing seasons. So in the Northeast where we live, there's been about a 10 day increase in the growing season, otherwise known as a frost free season length. If we look at precipitation change, those areas in the darkish greenish blue are those areas where it's had more precipitation than average. And in our area, it's been anywhere from 5 to 15% or more increase in rain and snowfall. When we look at severe precipitation events, there's been an even more dramatic increase in the Northeast, where the increase in very heavy precipitation is about 71% over what it had been historically and sea levels are rising as well. And so the rates at which it's rising now is anywhere from one to two feet per century, uh, but is expected to increase over time. And so all of these things, warmer temperatures, changes in precipitation, uh, at, at rise in sea level, these are all challenges that confront us as human beings, as human communities and societies, but also our natural ecosystems and the species that co-inhabit the Northeast with us. So the most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change basically says it very starkly that the recent changes in climate are widespread, rapid, and intensifying, and unprecedented in thousands of years. It's indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events including heat waves, heavy rainfall, droughts more frequent and more severe. And so basically we have two tasks before us. One is we need to slow the rate of global warming and climate change. And the second is we need to prepare for the changes that are already happening and will continue into the future. So mitigation is what we call the steps that we take to try to reduce global warming, such as reducing greenhouse gas emissions by driving electric vehicles, by putting up solar panels, and a number of other things like insulating your house and, and using less energy. Today I'm going to talk about the other type of action that we can take, which is adaptation, which is coping with the global warming and its resulting climate change effects.
So for mitigation, we're fortunate in Massachusetts that we have proactive government that has produced a roadmap for decarbonization. And decarbonization is just a big word for reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. And there's been a law and a pledge that we are going to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050. And this document provides a, a roadmap on how we might get there, including elements such as land protection so that we can continue to store carbon in our forests and our wetlands, energy conservation, uh, investing in energy efficiency, uh, electrification so that we can turn everything from gas and coal and oil into electricity-based energy and then replacing those sources of electricity with renewable energy. And as I mentioned, conserving some of our natural landscapes is another way that we can mitigate the impacts of climate change. And as we conserve our forests, for instance, by photosynthesis, they're binding up carbon dioxide and turning it into uh, trunks and branches and twigs and flowers and leaves and seeds and things like that. And so just by conserving our forested landscape, we can do some good to mitigate the impacts of our greenhouse gas emissions. But what is climate change adaptation? It's essentially a way of trying to anticipate the changes that are going to come with global warming and taking steps to reduce the impact. And so that might include things like protecting our roads and, and infrastructure from the damaging effects of the more severe storms that we're likely to get. I'm going to focus primarily in this presentation on how we can use climate change adaptation to protect vulnerable species and ecosystems. So basically climate change adaptation are actions that we can take to reduce the negative impact of climate change and keeping our eyes open for ways that we might take advantage of the potential new opportunities that come uh, with climate change. And in particular, I'm going to focus on three particular approaches that we can use as different types of climate adaptation. And we refer to this sometimes as RRT for resistance, resilience, and transformation. So one approach is to try to avoid climate-related impacts, and we call that resistance. So we're resisting the effects of climate change. So an example of this would be to, to find ways to increase water storage in upper parts of watersheds to avoid damaging scour that comes with floods and also deposition. Uh, we're familiar with in the Deerfield River watershed when Tropical Storm Irene came, it not only scoured out certain areas, but it also deposited enormous amounts of silt on the agricultural lands and floodplains uh, of the lower Deerfield. The second R is resiliency, and this is our ability, enhancing our ability to recover from climate related impacts. So sometimes we can try to avoid the impacts and that's what we call resistance. Sometimes those impacts are going to happen or, and are unavoidable, but our ability to recover from those impacts is called resiliency. So an example of this in terms of ecosystems is working to increase the, the diversity of our forests in terms of diversity of tree ages and, and species diversity so that if there is uh, some kind of a, an event like a fire or ice storm or wind storm damage, that the forest will recover more quickly. The third approach is transformation. And that is recognizing that changes are going to happen, but we might be able to guide those climate related changes to an acceptable future condition that we would find uh, easier to live with than what would happen on its own. And an example of this is, a, is an approach referred to as assisted migration, which is helping species move from where they are now to new areas that are likely to be suitable habitat in the future. So let me give you some examples of how we use RRT to identify opportunities to prepare for climate change and try to reduce the negative impacts of them. And the first ecosystem that I'm going to focus on are cold water streams. And cold water streams are required habitat for species that we refer to as cold water species, like brook trout and spring salamanders. And if the water warms too much, it becomes unsuitable as habitat for these cold water species. And now I want to introduce another concept, and that is the concept of refugia. And climate change refugia are areas that remain relatively buffered from contemporary climate change over time and enable the persistence of these valued ecosystems and, and habitats. 
So essentially, these are areas that are less likely to change over time, and so they're going to retain their ability to provide habitat for the species that are using them now. So if we think about this in terms of cold water streams, we expect that as air temperatures warm with global warming, that water temperatures are going to warm along with them. But there are some areas where there are significant inputs of groundwater where the water temperatures are going to warm much more slowly than they are in other areas where that have fewer groundwater inputs. And so these areas may actually stay cold and might provide habitat for cold water species and we refer to these areas as refugia. So some of the strategies, adaptation actions and strategies that we can use to try to protect cold water streams include identifying those river and stream reaches that are likely to remain cold over time and then assess the viability of these refugia so that we can prioritize those areas that we want to protect. We want to protect the land around these cold water refugia so that we have some control that they aren't developed and that the shading and the groundwater that comes into these streams will remain into the future. We can actually help cool the water in these streams by restoring riparian forests. So a riparian forest is just the forest that, that grows along the edges of streams and rivers, but it provides important shade that controls some of the temperature of the water in those waterways and water bodies. We can also reduce the temperature of these streams by disconnecting stormwater. And what does that mean? Well, think about a big parking lot in the middle of summer on a very, very hot day. Maybe it's 95 degrees, bright sunshine, and then it's followed up with a thunderstorm. And the thunderstorm produces a brief downpour of rain that hits the parking lot and then runs off the parking lot into a storm drain. Well, you know that the tar on that parking lot is going to be very hot. And so when the rainwater hits the parking lot and runs off, the water is going to be quite warm. If it goes into the storm drain and then discharges directly into a cold water stream, it's going to warm the water in the stream to unacceptably warm uh, temperatures. So one of the things that we can do is to make sure that that storm water doesn't go directly into the stream, but has an opportunity to infiltrate into the ground, to cool off, and then eventually join the stream later on. Dam removal is also an excellent opportunity for controlling temperature in cold water streams, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that is. And then the last thing is replacing culverts that are not suitable for fish and other organisms to pass through so that you have greater aquatic connectivity in your stream network. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So dam removal is important not only because these dams block the movement of fish and other organisms from swimming upstream, but because the water that's pooled up behind the dam is just sitting in the sunlight and getting warmer all the time. And when it finally does discharge through the dam or over the dam into the stream below, it's going to warm up those stream segments and make them, again, unsuitable for cold water species. I'm going to talk now about culvert replacement, and I'm going to talk about it in terms of uh, cold water refugia. So if we think about a stream network that has habitat for cold water fish like the brook trout. Today, it might actually include all of the different tributaries that lead into a main stem and the main stem itself is all suitable cold water habitat. Over time though, with global warming, we expect some portions of this network to be unsuitable because it's warm to the point where it no longer provides adequate habitat. So now our cold water refugia up in the tributaries are small patches of cold water habitat that remain after the rest of the system is warmed. Now these small areas are going to be vulnerable to extinction events because they have fewer individuals and they're, uh, you basically have your eggs all in a bunch of small baskets. But the key to long-term persistence is that you'll have movement from these different refugia patches from one patch to another. So they can still move through the main stem, they just can't live there for very long. And so as you've got movement of individuals from one patch to another, you're able to maintain a much larger population that's interconnected. But you also can recover better after you have some kind of adverse effect. So let's say there's a drought and a really hot period, and in three of those five tributaries, the populations disappear. And so now you have vacant habitat once the conditions improve, and the water gets cold again, but you have no fish there. But because you have movement throughout the system, you have a mechanism where you can recolonize those habitat patches 
and restore populations in areas where the suitable habitat has improved. But if we put roads through these systems and if the culverts are not suitable for animals to pass through, when we have these extinction events, the, pet, the mechanism we have for recolonizing those patches is basically short-circuited. And so if we remove these barrier culverts and replace them with something better, and so on, on the left in this photograph, you can see a culvert on Mitchell Brook in Waitley. And this is a place where there was very little fish passage because the, there was a big outlet drop at the end of the culvert. This has recently been replaced with a big open bottom arch where you actually have a natural stream bottom flowing through the culvert, which provides excellent fish passage. And by providing fish passage, you provide a mechanism for maintaining populations and the viability of cold water refugia even though climate change is still having an effect. Sometimes these small culverts that block the movement of fish are also vulnerable to being washed away during the heavy floods that we can get and the severe storms that we're likely to get in the future. And these failures not only are, are inconvenient when it re results in road closures, but it can also result in deaths. And so the photo on the right is from Alstead, New Hampshire, where a major culvert failure killed four people. So we also have to prepare for the extreme rain events that we're likely to get. And Irene showed us just how extreme they can look like. And so in the lower left, you can see the Bridge of Flowers in Shelburne. This is how high the water got during Tropical Storm Irene. And also we have to look at this, what happens during dry periods. And in the upper right is the Ipswich River that went completely dry recently. And we expect more droughts in the future, we expect more severe storms in the future, and we, we have to prepare for that. Not only is it a danger for people, but it's also damaging to the stream ecosystems. When you get these scouring events, it rips apart the banks, it, it destroys some of the, the stream channel, and it takes years, if not decades, for these streams to recover. And so one strategy that we can employ to try to adapt to these changes that are going to happen is to find ways to store more water in the upper watersheds so that we can reduce the storm impacts during high flooding events and also maintain base flow or the, the flow of water from groundwater that, make, that provides flow in the streams during the summertime when it's usually dry. And some examples of how we do that is we can take streams that have been straightened and restore channel complexity and sinuosity. We can tolerate beavers because beavers and beaver dams are a great way of slowing water down and holding it up in the upper parts of the watershed. Reduce the impervious surfaces like parking lots so that we can infiltrate more water into the ground and it will then move much more slowly through the soil and provide base flow during dry periods. Reconnecting rivers and streams with their floodplains so there's an opportunity for floodwaters to move out and spread out across the floodplain and slow down and not go downstream quite so fast. We can create wetlands that are great for slowing down water. In urban areas, we can use things like rain gardens and other stormwater management techniques to prevent runoff that can result in these damaging floods. And another strategy that is sometimes used is actually putting wood in some of our small streams in the upper parts of watersheds. And so woody debris in the stream slows water down. And although you might think, well, what is one log going to do? We're not really talking about one log. We're talking about logs throughout the streams, in all streams, as a way of actually slowing water down. Moving on to forests, we have some concern about our northern forest types, like spruce fir forests and northern hardwood forests. And so there are strategies for trying to protect our northern forests as well. Some of them fall in the category of resistance, like identifying, protecting, and interconnecting northern forest refugia, reducing drought and fire risk to our forests by managing the forests accordingly, reduce the risks for invasive species and diseases, and to retain stress-resistant trees that have already been through difficult times and may be genetically more able to cope with those kinds of stresses in the future. In terms of resilience, we can work to increase the diversity in our forests. We mean species diversity, which means the number of different species of trees that are there, but also age and size diversity. You want to have young trees, you want to have old trees, you want to have middle-aged trees, so that if you do have a big blowdown and most of your big trees fall over, you've got a lot of other advanced regeneration ready to go to fill the gaps. 
and we want to have a diversity of environmental conditions that's going to maintain a diversity of species and age classes over time. And then finally transition, and as an example of this I'm going to talk about assisted migration where you might actually plant certain tree species that occur in the south but are likely to move into our area in the future. We might think about species substitution so that if we're worried that we might lose our hemlock, which is an important shade tree for cold water streams, perhaps there's another species that we can use to provide the same function. And also think about some of the trees that are at the northern edge of their range, like tulip poplar, and make sure that we retain mature examples of those trees that can serve as a seed source to help natural expansion of populations as climates change. And then finally, I want to finish by talking about probably the most vulnerable ecosystem that we have in Massachusetts, and that's salt marshes. And salt marshes grow along the coasts of Massachusetts and many other areas of the world, and they have for many thousands of years been able to keep up with rising and falling sea level because those increases and decreases in water elevation happen slowly enough that these salt marshes can build up biomass by building up peat and also trapping sediment, they're able to actually increase their elevation along with sea level rise. And then as sea level drops, you get less sediment trapping and you get more decomposition of the peat and salt marshes then go down in elevation. What we're concerned about now is, is that we have altered some of these salt marshes and we've made them vulnerable to sea level rise. So back in the 1930s, there was a tremendous effort put forward to ditch the salt marshes throughout the Atlantic coast and this was done to make them more suitable for harvesting salt hay, but also to try to eliminate mosquitoes. And those ditches have actually done a great deal of harm to our salt marshes. And by draining the salt marsh, we actually allowed more oxygen into the peat, more decomposition, and the peat in those areas, the elevation of those marshes has decreased. Subsidence is what we call that. And so now we're worried that with rising sea levels and with these ditches, we're going to see much more flooding of these salt marshes throughout the tide cycles. Usually they only flood a couple of times a month, but now they're flooding much more frequently because they're not able to keep up with sea level rise. And as a result, some of the species that nest in these salt marshes, like salt marsh sparrows, are unable to get through their nesting period without them being flooded out. And so there are things that we are doing to try to address that problem, and it's an urgent issue and people are working very quickly to develop and test techniques that might restore these salt marshes to health. One is trying to eliminate the ditches that were built uh, or dug out in the 1930s. And so ditch remediation, where we fill the ditches from the bottom up slowly over time so that it's not a shock to the system, but we can eventually restore the natural hydrology. We are also using ditches, shallow ditches, what are called runnels, to try to drain those areas where water is ponding up on the marsh platform. And in that way, Draining the, just a little bit of that water off allows the vegetation to grow more vigorously, to produce more biomass, produce more peat, and help keep up with sea level rise. Another experimental technique that's being used and tested is called thin layer deposition, where sediment is sprayed or deposited on the marsh surface as a way of just gaining maybe six inches of altitude, of elevation, and viewing that as often as necessary to make sure that the marsh keeps its head above water. And they're also experimenting with something called living shorelines, where they use sometimes oyster reefs and sometimes rock dams along the coastline to create protected areas within which salt marshes can develop. These salt marshes may not be spectacular habitat, but they do provide a buffer for the houses, uh, businesses, roads, and other infrastructure that are there along the coastline so that the waves that are generated by intense storms get broken up by the rock and by the plants and do less damage to the shoreline. And so at last, I just want to mention that a lot of what we're doing is learning as we do things. We're trying out ideas, we're testing them, we're sharing information, and, and we have an organization in Massachusetts called Mass ECAN, which stands for the Massachusetts Ecosystem Climate Adaptation Network, and it's a community of practice where people who are interested in climate adaptation can meet, can, can listen to presentations, can go on field trips and learn more about what's being done to adapt to climate change and try to get tips on what might be something that's worth doing in your community.
So thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about a very important issue that confronts us and about how people are working together to try to address those issues.